I changed the title to the to uh, to engineering healthcare systems because I'll, I'll tell you a story about the way we're doing it, but uh, the way we're doing it is influencing the way other people are doing it in part because of NHGRI support. Uh, I will have to start by uh, by thanking uh, the organizers for for inviting me to be the the mouthpiece for this uh, electronic medical records kind of effort. Um, so this is the map that you've uh, seen before, and if you haven't. Uh, I don't know what rock you've been hiding under. Uh, uh, we are, I'm going to talk about uh, this space right here, genomic predictors of disease susceptibility and drug response, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about engaging the electronic medical record for discovery purposes, not for patient care purposes. And then I'll talk a little bit about engaging the electronic record for uh, delivering genomic medicine. So there are many definitions of genomic medicine. I'm part of a working group at NHGRI that, that uh, spent an inordinate amount of time working on these words. Uh, and these are the words for better or worse, and, and when I argue with Eric about changing those words, I, I get told that the words are done, let's, let's work on something else. So, um, uh, and I think that this is a very reasonable definition, I don't want to say that it's not. Um, I, I will say that genomic medicine is part of a greater vision of what I think, uh, what people are calling precision medicine or personalized medicine. I like personalized medicine better than precision, but that's a debate we can have later. I think because precision may overpromise. And personalized means you're taking care of a single patient. I'll come back to that theme later. Uh, any uh, clinician who wants to uh, give a talk has to quote or at least acknowledge William Osler. I'm a Canadian, and William Osler was a Canadian, so I have to acknowledge him twice. And so he'll say that the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So it is an important part of what we do, and it has been an important part of medicine all the way along. The addition of genomic information just makes it that much more complicated, but that much more personalized. So here is the, here's one view of the vision published in the New Yorker in 2000 when, the, when the, that famous press conference happened. And this woman is handing her, 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 uh, her sequence to a, to a pharmacist, not to a physician, but to a pharmacist. So it emphasizes sort of that this is going to be team sport. She has also has it written down on a piece of paper, so almost certainly that's not the way it's going to work. And he has, he's pretty confused, and, and that is certainly the way it's going to work. I, I was of two minds whether to show this, this other part. Um, when, when Francis Collins was appointed uh, director of NIH, uh, he was asked about pharma he was asked about a lot of things, but he was asked about pharmacogenomics, and this is what he had to say in one paragraph, because pharmacogenomics is the easy stuff. You can read it. Uh, I'll just say that uh, there must be a pointer here somewhere. Uh, I'll, I'll say that uh, if everyone's DNA sequence is already in their medical record, it's simply a click of the mouse to find out all the information you need. There's going to be a lower barrier, and then wonderful things will happen and improve outcomes and reduce adverse events. And obviously, uh, those of us who, who play in this space really buy into that idea, but I will say this, and I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, that uh, I disagree with that particular word, because it's anything but simple, as those of us who are trying to do it have discovered. So uh, I think the way that this is going to happen uh, is that uh, some institutions, and then more and more institutions, will buy into this idea, and how are they going to implement? I think you have to implement by having excellence in basic science. I'm going to come back to that over and over again. This is not unidirectional. The translation and the implementation feed discovery science. There's a commitment to information technology which cannot be overemphasized. We're very fortunate at my place to have a department of biomedical informatics that has 75 faculty members, which is pretty big. Uh, and then you uh, put your healthcare system to work for discovery, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then uh, once you've discovered something that you think is actionable, then you can start to put it to work for patient care. And the point is that this is uh, an iterative process, and so it goes back and forth. So what we've done for discovery, in a, in a nutshell, is we've created a biobank. We can talk about the biobank forever, but as of yesterday, uh, there were uh, samples for 163,941 patients in the biobank, uh, those are DNA samples, and uh, and it's a pretty large number, and they're coupled to electronic medical records. What can you? Why do you need it so big? And what can you do with it so big? I probably don't have to emphasize that to this audience, but I thought I would just walk you through a, a, a question that I was asked by one of our new faculty members. He said, "You have any patients who have vitamin D levels? You have any patients who have vitamin D levels and GWAS data as well?" So uh, one of the rules of the game is once you do a GWAS on any one of these samples, it comes back to the resource. So uh, I went to a new resource uh, that I'm proud to show off, and I would love to do it in real time, where we just uh, go to a website, and uh, this is what the web based interf interface looks like. I type in vitamin D, and I drag and, drag and drop, and it asks me what kind of vitamin D level you want, and I say any lab value, 
And it turns out that in our electronic medical record, there are 13,847 people who have vitamin D levels. And there is a reason that this number and this number don't agree with each other. It, it's not just that we add it up differently. That there's a great reason somebody can ask me that afterwards. Uh, those of them in the biobank, that's a subset of the entire electronic record, is 5,497. Then I can ask how many people have had GWAS genotyping. Right now, it's, it's more like 20,000, but there are only 10,000 in this particular interface right now. And the intersection is 1,000 people. So that's a big set. And you can get the GWAS data on these people with vitamin D levels for free, uh, essentially. So it's, uh, it's an enabling resource for discovery. Uh, but the point is you start with 163,000 to get to this set of 1,000. So if you start with 10,000, you're going to get down to a set of 20 or something like that, some relatively useless number. So I think you have to have big numbers. Uh, and what we're doing in BioView is we're looking for genomic variants that are associated with all the things that you might think of. And then we're doing an inverse experiment called FIWAS, which I'll tell you more about in a second. Uh, so rather than dwelling on, on triumphs of BioView itself, I'll just say that we're part of the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network that NHGRI funds. These are the nodes in the current iteration of the network. There are nine nodes, ten centers, uh, and there's a reason, again, that those ma that math doesn't add up perfectly. Uh, and what we do is we define phenotypes within the electronic medical record and then identify cases and controls for, to identify genomic variants that, that drive those phenotypes. Uh, one of the things that we have learned over the last five or six years of doing eMERGE 1 and eMERGE 2 is that uh, writing the phenotypes and validating the phenotypes to find cases and controls is pretty challenging. We've gotten pretty good at it, I think. We can, we're certainly very good at finding diseases. We're not so good, when I say we, I don't mean me. I mean the informatics guys who work in, on this. Uh, I'm just a, a mouthpiece. Um, but we've gotten pretty good at, uh, at that. The next challenge is finding people who have a disease followed by a drug exposure, followed by a drug response phenotype. And that's a little more challenging, and we're working on that part as well. Uh, all the phenotypes are publicly posted in something called FKB or ph pharmaco the phenome knowledge base, and this is what a web shot looks like. Basically, all the phenotypes are listed there, who's done them, how validated they are, and what's interesting is what kind of elements go into them, what kind of codes, what kind of natural language processing, uh, medications. There are all kinds of different ways that you can have of, of, a, a val of identifying and validating uh, a phenotype, and we go through a lot of hand curation to make sure the phenotypes work right. So those are there for anybody who wants to play in the electronic medical record space. Uh, <clears throat> I am an, a, an electrophysiologist, cardiac electrophysiologist, when I'm not doing this for a living. So I thought I would show you one eMERGE project that came out of a, an electrophysiology idea, and that is um, uh, we were looking, interested in variability in the QRS complex in the electrocardiogram. That's this little ditzel here that tells you how fast conduction is in the heart. There's reasons that we, we think we should look at that. So the first thing we did was we developed algorithms to find patients who had a normal electrocardiogram, no heart disease, normal electrolytes, no confounding drugs, really, really normal people, and deployed it in the entire electronic record, not the, just the subset with DNA, and found 30,000 people. Andrea Ramirez, who is in this audience and who's now working on this campus, uh, directed that effort at our place, and uh, and um, and this is what the distribution of the QRS complexes look like. So these are these are entirely normal individuals, and we're interested in why people are up at this end versus down at this end. So we did our uh, genome-wide association study, supported by eMERGE, supported by eMERGE one, and got no signal. Then deployed that algorithm across the eMERGE network, got lots more cases, lots more control, lots more cases because it's only case only study, and, and this is what the Manhattan plot looks like, and, and this is a signal in uh, a, actually a pretty good candidate gene anyway. So this is the cardiac sodium channel locus that, uh, this is the cardiac sodium channel. This is a different sodium channel that people have gotten interested in because of this kind of work, and, uh, and that controls conduction in the heart. So it, it's all very well and good. So we did, we then did another experiment to sort of validate this, this result, and what we did was something called a pheno, we've called a phenome-wide association. So, GWAS, you take a phenotype and you say yes or no if it's a, if it's a discrete phenotype. And you look across 500,000 or a million or 14 million SNPs and do a test of association at each locus. What we did was we said, let's take 13,000 people who have been genotyped at this particular SNP and say wild type or variant, sorry, reference or variant, I'm not supposed to say wild type, reference or variant, and do a test of association with every single diagnosis that we have in the electronic medical record. There are about a thousand, and we've, we recognize there's overlaps across those different phenotypes, but we, we, have, we have ways of making this more and more sophisticated, and this is what the Manhattan plot looks like for, uh, 
for this particular SNP that, that happened to be the top one on the Manhattan plot that I just showed you. And what's interesting is these two dots here are arrhythmias, ar arrhythmia diagnoses. So you sort of say, well, he's an arrhythmia guy and he started with an arrhythmia question, so that's not a big deal. So at the very least, we, we, re we rescue the signal that we started with. But remember, we started with people who had normal electrocardiograms. We didn't start with people who had arrhythmias. They get arrhythmias later because we have the electronic record that follows them for years and years and years. So what this says is that when you start out at one end of that distribution, you're more likely to get an arrhythmia, and here's a genomic predictor of that. And then we were asked by the reviewers to uh, uh, look at it over time, and, and there is a gene dose effect over time with the development of atrial fibrillation. And this is in a gene called SCN. 10A. SCN10A is, uh, was originally cloned from the dorsal root ganglion, and so the, the way it affects heart conduction has pre been pretty controversial. Uh, one of the other hats that I wear is we study those kinds of problems in, uh, in, my, in my mouse and fish lab, and so we actually looked at what happens uh, to wild-type myocytes. These are action potentials from mouse myocytes at baseline, and then when you put in a tiny, tiny, tiny concentration of a sodium channel opening, toxin called ATX. And that's what happens in wild-type mice. We have generated sodium SCN10A knockout mice, and we actually don't see that arrhythmogenic effect, and, and, and in fact, that's reproduced. So I, I throw this in just to make sure that people know that I still think about this kind of stuff every so often, and also to make the point that, that there is this loop that has to be closed. Everybody has said we have now have 3,000 more signals or 3,000 more loci to look at than we did 10 years ago, and we better start to look at them, because maybe this is a drug target, for example. So we've, uh, we've deployed the FIWAS algorithm across the entire GWAS catalog uh, supported by NHGRI. So that's about 1,300 different uh, tests of association. Some of them are with phenotypes that are not well captured in the electronic record. Like, uh, do you, uh, do you, does your urine smell after you eat asparagus? Uh, are you bald? Those are things that the electronic record doesn't capture very well. So we don't we don't pay attention to those in our validation studies. So it, here's an example of a highly pleiotropic SNP. This is a SNP in IRF4 that, that determines skin color, but when you do the, the FIWAS, you get tremendously, power, tremendously significant signals for various kinds of skin cancer as well as actinic keratoses. Um, and, uh, and it turns out that the that, that SNPs that are highly validated, highly replicated in the GWAS catalog replicate this way as well. And we have about 70 new associations using this uh, approach to discover pleiotropy. This is what eMERGE2 looks like. The number, don't take the numbers excessively seriously uh, because, for example, this one says 27,000. It's probably, like I said, more like 20,000, but we, we count immunochip and metabochip in this, in this as well. So there's 300,000, 330,000 or so people in eMERGE Two, there are about 75,000 with dense genotypic data uh, that we're actually putting together in a very large set. Uh, so this highlights for me the paradox of personalized medicine. As a, as a clinician, I, I have one patient in front of me in the office, but what I need to do is be able to treat them differently from the average. And in order to do that, I have to have a very large data set to convince me that that, that, that different treatment is in fact uh, justified. So that's the uh, discovery piece. Then the implementation piece. So um, we've been hearing all day about pharmacogenetics. That's the easy stuff. And that's probably the first thing that's going to be implemented. I've been doing pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetics uh, my entire career. And uh, uh, we're part of the Pharmacogenomics Research Network, another effort funded by, uh, by NIH. Uh, Eric already alluded, alluded to the fact that there are now uh, many, many drugs that have uh, uh, labels that include pharmacogenetic information. This is only for germline. The other half of the drugs that, that, uh, that have labels are for the, uh, for the tumor germline, or the tumor, uh, tumor genome. So everybody says it's easy, and uh, I like to show this. It's, uh, it's, it is low-hanging fruit, but it's, uh, but it's not so simple. Um, I'll, just, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just say that. So we were tasked by our leadership to uh, to come up with a way of start to starting to deliver pharmacogenomic information in a preemptive way into the electronic medical record in, uh, in the fourth quarter of 2009. We were given a year to plan. And uh, so this is what the planning looks like, and I'm not going to walk you through any of this. If, if anything, you should just read down these things to understand that there are multiple communities that you have to engage uh, uh, and excite in order to execute a project like this. This is what we call our PREDICT project, and this is what PREDICT stands for. 
So the notion is, in brief, find patients who are at high risk for getting a drug with one of those actionable pharmacogenetic stories, one of those 58 drugs, and then you genotype them, not on the drug you think they're going to get, but on a bunch of different drugs, uh, on a multiplex platform that, uh, that assays many different uh, pharmacogenomic variants, and then you do what I call the easy stuff. Uh, you store the genomics, track the outcomes, provide uh, informatics support to clinicians who are prescribing the drug at the appropriate time. So who is at high risk? Well, one group of people who are at high risk are people who uh, populate our internal medicine clinics. We, d we did a uh, study in about 50,000 people in the electronic medical record asking the question over the course of five years, how many of them are exposed to one or more of those drugs that have FDA labels? The answer was a bit of a surprise. There are 65% of them that get at least one drug from that, from that list over the course of five years, and 15% that get 10 percent, that get, sorry, 15, 15% get four or more drugs. So that's one group of high-risk people, and we are actually including them in the PREDICT project. The other high-risk group of people are people who you can look at and say, within the next week or two, you're going to get drug X. And one of the, the best example of that is that people going to the cath lab at Vanderbilt, uh, we do about 4,000 catheterizations a year. About 1,800 of those patients end up uh, on clopidogrel. And as we were planning this project, the FDA did us a favor, relabeled clopidogrel to include uh, this, this statement, consider alternative treatment or treatment strategies in patients identified as CYP2C19 poor metabolizers. CYP2C19 is the enzyme that uh, bioactivates the prodrug clopidogrel into its uh, biologically active uh, metabolites. And I have to say here that uh, it was Grant Wilkinson, a faculty colleague of mine, uh, who in the mid-1980s discovered the fact that CYP2C19 was polymorphic. He was not studying clopidogrel, and uh, I remember me and many other people gave him a, an incredibly hard time because he was studying this incredibly obscure drug and a, probably a pointless line of uh, inquiry, and in fact it turned out he was right that it, uh, it was an important thing to, to study because now it's the centerpiece of much of what goes on in pharmacogenomic implementation. The other thing we did was we took our BioView specimens, found a group of people, uh, who had uh, gotten a stent after an acute coronary event, uh, looked at 30-day outcomes and found 200 people with complications and 400 or 500 controls, and uh, replicated the known signal for CYP2C19 and its variant in terms of uh, imposing risk. So <clears throat> over the course of the last uh, uh, two and a half years, we've now studied about 12,521 patients in, uh, in PREDICT. Bruce Korf on the video uh, that you just saw uh, s described a program where you might uh, genotype people and then deploy the information when it became apparent, and this is, that's exactly what we're doing here. There are 334 homozygotes for CYP2C19-STAR2 and 2,369 heterozygotes, and what's interesting is that most people don't have a common variant. We don't actually know how many people have a rare variant. We know that they don't have a common variant. And just to show you that it give you a sense of that the fact that this is actually, although it's complicated, it's even more complicated than you think. It's not just star two that are the hypometabolizers. There's star three and star four, and you can be star three, star four. There's also a star 17 that nobody knows what to do with. And so the heterozygotes and homozygotes you saw on the pie chart are actually multiple genotypes. And how to translate from a genotype to a diplotype to a predicted phenotype is one of the challenges in the area. When a patient who has this information in their electronic medical record has an electronic prescription written for clopidogrel and are a poor metabolizer, this is the point of care decision support that pops up that suggests two alternative drugs, and we track how many times physicians look at this, how many times they change their minds, and, uh, and we're just learning about responses to this kind of program. And I thought I should show this picture um, because, again, it's about personalizing medicine. This is one of our interventional cardiologists, and when we started the program in September 2010, we were really eager to find the first STAR2, STAR2 patient, and this is she. So she is ta being taken care of by him, and he knows a little bit more about her now, and that's personalizing medicine, but he's taken care of her for a long time, so he knows a lot about her and her attitudes and her other diseases and her other medications, so, um, so that's what's important, and there's another quote from William Osler, which in the interest of time, I think I'll... I'll let you read, and now you've read it or not. So <clears throat> we've now um, deployed five drug gene pairs, clopidogrel, simvastatin, warfarin, thiopurines, and uh, tacrolimus, 
Uh, and those are displayed on the electronic medical record. This is a screenshot of what our electronic medical record looks like. I've blacked out all the identifiers, uh, except for, for this one here, because I want to make sure people know that I still see patients. Um, and, uh, and so these are, these are the, the genetic variants that belong to this particular patient. These are a partial list of his medications that actually go down here. And what's interesting to me uh, is that he's been on warfarin for a long time, so we actually didn't use the warfarin information uh, to, to tailor his dose, but he's, he, is a poor, he's a, he has a, a loss of functional allele in CYP2C9, and he does take a, a remarkably low dose of warfarin, only three milligrams a day. So that's probably the explanation, and had we known that at the beginning, we would have started on three milligrams a day. We also have to say, use this kind of technology to display uh, variants in tumors in an effort uh, very, very similar to, but probably smaller than the one you just heard from for Dr. Garraway in, in our personalized cancer uh, initiative. So, and that was a a BRAF mutation. The other thing, after you've deployed five drug gene pairs, you can start to ask the question, how many people have variants in one or more uh, uh, of, these, uh, of these pathways? And what's interesting is that uh, the number that don't have anything is now getting smaller. And of course, every time we deploy a new drug gene pair, the number has to get smaller. Uh, and, and one way to think, I mean, it's obvious, and it's almost trivial to sort of highlight it, except to point out that as if you're going to do multiplex testing, what you find out is that everybody in this audience is abnormal for something. And we all, if you live in genome land, like we all do, we all recognize that. But these are real data that speak to that. And, and so when I speak to, to lay audiences, when I speak to non-genomics audiences, it comes as a surprise to them sometimes that we're all abnormal for something. You just don't know what it is. So this multiplexed approach, I think, is really the only way to go. And, uh, and I think that uh, many people in this room uh, have thought that problem through. And, and understand that. Uh, we also engage patients so that we have a website called My Health at Vanderbilt where you can go and look at pieces of your record. Uh, you can make appointments with your doctor. When you look at pieces of your record, you can look at genes that affect my medicines, and then you can see your report for, for the drugs that we've targeted. Uh, those are all sort of works in progress, and uh, you can see we're sort of still figuring out exactly how to deliver that information. We steal from 20, so we, uh, sorry, we adapt 23andMe information to, uh, to, to think about this, because they do a reasonable job of explaining this, um, and, uh, uh, and we think that that's something that's going to be very, very important to engage patients in all this. Um, so we have PREDICT at Vanderbilt, uh, and, and I'm part of the PGRN, we're also part of the uh, eMERGE network, and, and so I was having a conversation with Terry Manolio, who directs the genomic medicine initiatives uh, at NHGRI, and, uh, and she said, well, why don't we take the PGRN's uh, next generation sequencing platform for all those important pharmacogenes that you guys are working on, and stick them in eMERGE in, the, in a PREDICT kind of algorithm. So that's sort of, that was a, an idea. Uh, born, uh, you know, at the end of a long day, and, and we've actually are doing that right now, and that project is underway, so it takes advantage of the expertise and capabilities of two separate networks that I think ought to be closer aligned than they are, and I'm working on that. So <clears throat> I want to just summarize by, by, by highlighting in, in words what the, uh, what the lessons are. So first of all, I think that we have not finished discovering. So those of us who focus on implementation are working on trying to deliver some of that to, to patients, but that doesn't mean that we, we know everything we need to know. We need to know a lot more, uh, and you've heard, heard that all day today. The low-hanging fruit of pharmacogenomics is much more complicated than we think, but I think learning the lessons that we're learning along the way in this space will make us smarter in terms of delivering genomic uh, information in the course of healthcare more generally. Uh, some of the problems I've highlighted, this business of rare variants is going to be a, a real problem in pharmacogenomics and everywhere else. Uh, and then there's the problem of ancestries, which we're only beginning to think about now. Uh, this is team science, it's interdisciplinary, and you have to engage lots and lots of people. Not just, not just get their grudging approval, but get their enthusiastic uh, engagement. There are huge educational needs for, in every constituency that you can think about. The evidence changes, even in pharmacogenomics, where you sort of say, well, CYP2C19 does this, and then a year later you think, well, maybe it does this in some other context. So you really have to be attuned to the fact that the advice you deliver today may not apply perfectly tomorrow. We, uh, it goes without saying, but I have to say it, that uh, an Illumina run might be 99% accurate. I have no idea what that number really is, but that's not good enough for a clinician uh, because it has to be 100% accurate. Uh, and the reason is 
I'll, I'll, I'll just say it. For those, for those of you who are clinicians, you'll understand me. I walk onto the wards and the, and the nurse or the resident says to me, that this patient has renal failure. Their creatinine is eight today. And I say, well, what does their electrocardiogram look like? How do they feel? And they feel fine and their electrocardiogram is normal. I say, well, that's a lab mistake. Any clinician would tell you, must be a lab mistake. But if, I, if somebody says this is a person is a poor metabolizer, I have no context for that. So I have to be sure that the data I get is, is correct. I think this is only going to happen in, in an electronic medical record environment. We're thinking about ways in which to deliver this kind of thing to people who have less advanced electronic medical record systems than we do, but I think that's going to happen. And the only way this really happens is with institutional will. So I'll just close by talking about the teams. I've acknowledged these teams up here. These are the individuals at Vanderbilt. I can't walk my way through all of them, but there are geneticists, informaticists, ethicists, lab people, fellows, translational scientists, and these three guys down here who are the institutional leadership. So thank you very much again for the opportunity to participate. So our next speaker, before he sits down, is David Botstein from uh, Princeton. And David is going to tell us about the fruits of the genome sequences for society. <laughs> 